Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to see you. If I were at home, I would just say, what's up, y'all? I bring you greetings from the Big Apple and from the best slice of the Big Apple, uh, the borough of Brooklyn and the Emmanuel Baptist Church. I want to thank you for the privilege of standing in this place. The fact is, when I heard about uh, what was happening to my friend, I didn't hesitate uh, that we have been like brothers for 35 years. Uh, and uh, the fact is, when I heard what was happening, I simply made arrangements to head here as quickly as possible. Because I understand that if you're a real friend, I I'm not talking about fair-weathered friends, but if you are a real friend, then for me, the way I measure friendship is are you there when I need you? And he has been present with me and to me uh, through life's ups and downs. And so uh, turnabout is fair play. And I count it a signal honor to stand with him and be supportive of him. You know, let me say this parenthetically. Uh, the friends of Job did what was wise at first. They heard about what happened and then they agreed to meet up and then they decided to travel uh, to where Job was at their own expense. Notice he didn't call them, but rather they just heard what happened and they uh, made arrangements to see him. And then the text says that when they saw how great his grief was, none of them said anything. I, I think there and then is a word for you and me. It's very instructive. Sometimes we just need to go and engage in the ministry of presence. Not trying to be wise, not trying to offer a theological rationale, just go be present with people and to people, and I think it'll make all the difference in the world. Now, when they opened their mouths, that's what was problematic. And so uh, I just uh, suggest that we take a page from their book. There is a word for the Lord that comes out of the book of Genesis, Genesis, the sixth chapter, Genesis, the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse. I want to invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Genesis, the sixth chapter, beginning at the first verse and concluding at the eighth verse. We find these words. When people began to multiply on the face of the, of the ground and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. They were the heroes that were of old warriors of renown. The Lord said that wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thought of their hearts was only, continue, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and the birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of God. Here at the reading of the scripture, may the word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your pathway. You may be seated. I want to invite you, if you will, to look at your neighbor on either your right or left. Look him or her in the eye. And if they refuse to look at you, just keep staring. <laughs> and if you will repeat after me, we're about to go inside the mind of a storm starter. Amen. Thank you very kindly for having introduced the central theme of the sermon. I want to apply this tag to the text, inside the mind of a storm starter. Inside the mind of a storm starter. Pray with me. Oh God, we gather in this space and we do so acknowledging what an incredible privilege it is. We thank you, oh God, for this place known as New Beginnings. 
We pray, oh God, that each time that we enter into these doors, we thank you for the fresh start that you've given us, not simply at Calvary's cross, but the fresh start that you've given us each day. You, oh God, have allowed us today to awaken. And we thank you, oh God, for the gift of life. We thank you in the words of our elders that our covers weren't uh, our winding sheet and that our bed was not our cooling board. We thank you, oh God, for the gift of love and of life. We thank you for the capacity to learn from our mistakes and to be better tomorrow than we were today or yesterday. Now open up our hearts, O oh God, that we might be able to say with David that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now I pray as I have before what is dark in me illumined, what is low raise and support, that I might interpret your will and your way to your sons and your daughters. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and for his cause we pray. And the sons and daughters of God said, amen. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Criminal Minds, I believe, is in its 14th or 15th season. It's a show that has been aired for some time. And I've discovered that either people love it or hate it. People are not ambivalent about it. They're unequivocally clear about where they stand on criminal minds. They're those like my wife and daughters who find it to be far too macabre, far too negative, far too uh, much of that which illuminates the underbelly of life. And rather than watch something that is bad news, they long to see some good news, something beautiful, something wonderful. I, on the other hand, prefer the show largely because I discover that it combines cinematic categories that I appreciate. You have a psychological thriller, you have action, you have drama. Criminal Minds centers around this uh, crackpot team of razor sharp law enforcement, people who bear responsibilities for uh, trying to track down uh, grade A predators. And when they do so, they, they use skills that the average law enforcement do not possess. They have with them a, a criminal profiler, uh, and sometimes more than one, who bear responsibility for unearthing what are the, the <clears throat> excuse me, unearthing uh, what are the environmental issues that have contributed to sh shaping, or I should say misshaping, uh, the person who is at large. Sometimes they will talk about the lack of education. Sometimes they will talk about poverty as an issue the, or neighborhoods in which the person grew up. But then there are those on the team uh, who take it a step further. A and these are persons who are uh, psychological criminologists. They bear responsibility for getting inside the mind of the criminal and being able to predict based on what have been uh, the intrapsychic conflicts, the unhealed issues that are deep and often uh, have misshapen and deformed their psycho-spiritual outlook. They bear responsibility for pinpointing based on their knowledge of what motivates the criminals in question for cornering uh, or predicting where they might be apprehended, where they might be intercepted by the team. They, sometimes they go back to a place that, that holds a special meaning for them, places that are near and dear to their hearts, places that are familiar to them. Well, I share that with you because as I scan the pages of this ancient story, I am unequivocally convinced that the narrator, that the writer of this story must have been a theological profiler. I submit to you that the person must have been a theological profiler because as you look at the text, you and I discover that the narrator has confidential and inside information. The narrator perhaps um, <clears throat> has secured through the medium of revelation and I don't know whether or not it was a, a gradual revelation or a shock 
a spiritual inspiration, but the, but the narrator is able to fathom what's going on inside the mind of God. The narrator lets us know that uh, that God is having great difficulty. God uh, has become greatly displeased based on what God sees. The text tells us, and you can trace uh, from verse 7 back to verse 5. The text says that, uh, that God sees. And it does not tell us initially what God sees. We have to read. And can I say this to you parenthetically? Uh, that you and I bear responsibility for reading the word of God. Uh, you have one of the most superb preachers in the country. But what you may underestimate is not simply his preaching gifts, but his teaching gifts. But even so, you bear responsibility for making sure that you don't go off of what pastor says. But rather you double check pastor. And you make sure that you follow the dictum of the Apostle Paul. Follow me only in so far as I follow Jesus Christ. Somebody here needs to be uh, not just in the pulpit, but in the pew. People who rightly divide the word of truth. If you do so, you won't wind up drinking Kool-Aid in Guyana. But rather you will know the word for yourself. And I'm not just talking about uh, that which is the written word. I'm talking about him who is the living word. And you'll discover that when you read the pages of the Bible that, that God will speak to you. And oftentimes, we're expecting God to speak in language that's easy to understand. And what I want you to know, that God will speak to you in a vernacular uh, that you will hear his voice, but what you need, or her voice if you prefer. But what you need to know is simply this, that when God speaks, you have to get close enough to him, and you have to be still, and you have to be silent, largely because C.S. Lewis is right. He said that God shouts to us in our pain, but more often not, he whispers to us in everyday moments. And if you will not get quiet, you and I will never hear the voice of God speaking. The issue becomes, what was he looking at? As he looked at life, what was he looking at? And the answer is there in the text. It says that he saw that the inclination, and let me be more specific, he says, Every inclination, he uses that qualifier. He, he's saying that there, uh, there is not any shadow of a doubt. There's no reservation. It includes everything. He says that every inclination of the human heart, God can fathom the human heart. God knows what's going on on the scales of our heart, mind, and spirit. And we may be able to fool the person next to us. But God knows I hear Samuel say that, that God does not look upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And the truth be told, sometimes we think we know people's motivation. Sometimes we think we know what people are. Sometimes we think we know what motivates them, what encourages them, what drives them. But the truth be told, only God alone knows. And it's only God who is the final arbiter of our actions. And one day, Paul said, all of us, didn't say just some of us, all of us. He didn't just say uh, the saved. All of us, sinner and saved, will have to stand before the judgment bar of God and give an account of that which we have done in life, whether good or bad. And I heard uh, one person say, Alan Bosick, that every day is judgment day. Now, the truth of the matter is you're, you're waiting for some eschatological event at the end of time once you pass through the, the corridor of death and you enter into eternity. But you need to know that God is making judgments day in and day out. God sees what other people don't see. God knows what other people don't know. And the truth of the matter is today you're sitting here looking good, smelling good, but God knows whether or not there are not simply skeletons in the closet, but God knows if there are cadavers. In the you know the difference between a skeleton and a cadaver, don't you? A uh, cadaver still has flesh on it, which suggests that it's recent. And, and I know you're at New Beginnings, and I'm clear. Uh, you're prim and proper, and uh, you, you may feign that you're sinless, uh, but the truth of the matter is you're not sinless. Uh, you just sin less than you used to because you can't do the stuff. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. 
Paul said all of our righteousness is no more than filthy rags. And therefore, you and I need to sit up here, not as pious peacocks, but we need to throw ourselves on the grace and the mercy of God and be able to say, I don't stand here based on my merit, but rather on his mercy. I don't stand this, on this ground because of who I am and where I've been, but I'm here because the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generation. He saw that every inclination right, uh, uh, was evil continually. And that is in the cycle of division, of disorientation, of death, of destruction, there's no break. That it's recurrent. It happens over and over again, 24 seven. And you and I can document from our personal experience that there must be something to this. That's why we don't watch the news. That's why we turn off CNN and we turn off MSNBC. We don't want to hear it anymore that we are filled up to hear with bad news. So much so that sometimes we forget that there is good news. And I've come by here to tell you that the God sees God sees what's going on in 45's administration. God knows the difference between fake news and the truth. God can detect the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And I've come back here to tell you that, uh, that he may be able to pull the proverbial wool over some people's eyes. But we know that the emperor has no clothes on. We are unequivocally clear that we can detect when he's lying because that's whenever he has his mouth open. He lies. God sees how he has systematically and insidiously like a fox. We think he's stupid, but he's crazy like a fox. He has kicked out from underneath us uh, all of those legal pieces that guarantee justice and equality in education. He's kicked out from underneath us uh, in housing. He's done it in criminal justice uh, uh, circles. In fact, the Justice Department won't even hear any more cases against police officers. Even if they have committed such an egregious sin like what happened last night. I, I think it was an accident. I really do. He's, he's only been on the force for about a year, so I, I think he was made a knee-jerk response. Saw a figure, didn't take the time to figure out whether or not the figure that he saw uh, was the homeowner or not. But I just wonder, and I, I'm not in any way casting dispersions based on anybody's ethnicity and race. The people here are good folk. But one of the things I wonder is, if he was in an upscale neighborhood, would he have waited until he could discern the identity of the person? God sees that our position in this country and our position around the world has become virtually untenable. It is precarious. And it is difficult. Everywhere you see people of color, they're catching it. Not only in this country, but around the world. Catching it. And it's not just people of color, it's poor people of color. And it is women who are poor and of color who are catching it. Around the globe. He sees. What does he see? He, he, he sees uh, the ageism. Uh, in the tech industry in Silicon Valley and in Seattle. Uh, not just ageism, but racism. Uh, he, he sees how in the church we become more preoccupied with doctrine uh, than we do with rules, than we do with relationships. We're never going to be able to argue anybody from the LGBTQI community uh, into the kingdom, but rather we can love people into the kingdom. 
And I need to say this, and I'm not worried about it because two things. One, uh, the Holy Spirit got some mercure cone uh, for your toes, and I got a ticket leaving tomorrow, so I ain't worried about it. But for those persons who posit uh, that sexual orientation is a sin, sexual orientation doesn't have anything to do with what I've chosen. Sexual, or, uh, sexual orientation has to do with what floats my boat. And the truth of the matter is, if we condemn people based on how they've been designed, it is not them who's the problem. It's us who are the problem. And we tend to be more judgmental than we are compassionate. And the truth of the matter is, that's why our young people look at us like we're crazy. Because to them, we look like dinosaurs. Dealing with issues that the truth of the matter is, we don't even have sufficient warrant to make moral claims. In the Bible, if it was such an issue, why would there only be seven references? Seven, seven references, where there are hundreds of references on how we manage money, on how we deal with issues of injustice, but seven references, and we won't even do with those texts what we have been taught to do, which is, you know what's written, but what does it mean? That's a whole different subject. God sees how pharmaceutical companies are jacking up the prices for people who are here. And as a consequence, that's why we need to be supporting cannabis because cannabis is cheaper for seniors. Medical marijuana is cheaper for seniors than for seniors who are gripped with making a difficult decision. Either I'm going to get some more food this month or... I'm going to try to put the extra cash forward to make sure that I get my pharmaceuticals. That's an untenable and unfortunate and tragic position to put somebody in. Do I stay well or do I eat? Okay. And then they sell drugs on the open market to communities of color around the globe who can afford it. And they also have insisted that we that those communities of color, before they receive the pharmaceuticals, pay back the World Bank. So you're in debt, you got disease, but they won't give you what you need. You can see it, but you can't seize it. God sees. But that word for seize, it actually comes from a Hebrew word, which means, a, <clears throat> which comes from a word that means a judge. It's a word picture that means a judge who is an activist judge. Uh, that he not only sees what's going on, but he evaluates what's going on. And then when he evaluates what's going on, he acts on what he sees. Y'all not feeling me. All I'm just trying to tell you is he's not like the Senate Judicial Committee that has people come before them. Uh, and even before they come before them, uh, before they give answers about their character, their conduct, and their portfolio, uh, they're already passed through. Uh, not what's handed the fact that some of them have not been uh, trying cases have not won cases but yet they're judges for life adjudicating issues that that pinch and touch on your life and mine he sees but isn't it good to know that God's going to do something about what's going on I, I don't need a God who's observant I need a God who's involved I don't need a God who's detached I need a God who's invested in taking that which is wrong and dealing with it until it gets right. A God who can bring down hills and elevate valleys. A God who reminds us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. A God who reminds us that we can't have racial reconciliation without social and political liberation. Reconciliation and joy go hand in hand. He sees how our, some of our brothers and sisters, both black and white, are more preoccupied with photo ops than they are with calling to repentance. Both Democrats and Republicans for their failure to deliver 
the, on the responsibility that has been entrusted into their care. But watch this. He, he sees. But then, Pastor Derek, Pastor Victoria, it says something that scares me. The text says, verse 7, God was sorry. Now, at first, I'm like, I know when I'm sorry. Sometimes I say and do stuff without my social filter working. And uh, this is one of the reasons why Pastor Blacks and I get along so much. We're just blunt. You, you, you don't have to worry about what we're thinking. We'll tell you whether you ask or not. But the text says that God was sorry. God was sorry. Have you ever done anything that has made God sorry? Some of us act as if we're perfect instead of acknowledging that we're not perfect, but rather we're being perfected. And if you know you're not perfect, New Beginnings is a great place to be because neither the pastor nor the people act as if they are perfect, but rather they let you know that they're going to fuss, fight, fall out, sometimes fall down sometimes, but by virtue of God's grace and God's mercy, they're going to get up and make up and keep on working together, praying together, serving together, walking up the King's Highway together and modeling what it means to be the beloved community. A community that is characterized not only by justice and righteousness, but a community that is characterized by compassion. Love is the dominant impulse. And I'm not just talking about some soury, sappy emotion. Uh, a professor that Pastor Braxton and I used to take uh, said that sometimes we have a tendency to trivialize the love of God and, and we rob it of its potency. Uh, we engage in what's called sloppy agape. We just apply it willy nilly and fail to recognize that the yes, it is a case that nobody deserves love, uh, that we all need love. But at a certain point, you can wind up enabling and infanticizing people who refuse to change, refuse to grow up, refuse to make sure that they no longer eat pablum or they no longer eat the spiritual diet of babies, but rather they grow up and they learn to switch from milk to meat. Oh, okay, you're not feeling me. Uh, I hear you. Uh, when I was growing up, I'm going to date myself by doing this, uh, but when I was growing up, there was a character called Baby Huey. Big old duck, walking around in diapers, had a baby's bonnet on and, and had a top that was too uh, short for him. And, and baby Huey uh, failed to recognize that he was bigger. And because he was bigger, uh, he needed to have his big boy clothes on. Uh, and so he just kept walking around uh, in his little boy's clothes uh, in a big boy man body. Uh, come here. I'm just trying to tell you that some of us need to stop acting like baby Huey. Uh, some of us need to stop looking like baby Huey. Can I come a little further? Some of us need to stop wearing stuff that looks like baby Huey. It's too short. It's too tight. And I ain't just talking about the sisters. I'm talking about the brothers too. Got skinny pants on. You can barely move. And then not only got skinny pants on, but got them dragging off your butt. Nobody wants to behold your glory. Pull your pants up. But God was sorry. And I couldn't figure out what it meant when God said that God was, when the text says that God was sorry. And then I read where the King James Version says that God repented. It's the only time that we hear a term that is applied to humanity applied to divinity, that God repented. I understand how the creature would repent before the creator, how the, uh, the subject and sinner would, would uh, repent before the savior, but I don't understand how him who is the creator of the world, him who had mind as blueprint and tongue as two, spoke worlds into existence. I don't understand how he who stuck the sun into the socket of the solar system and mounted the moon on the mantle of eternity. I don't understand how he had to repent. But I believe the message version helps me here. What the message version says, and I infer from it, 
is that what God saw broke God's heart. I think it breaks God's heart when mothers in Africa, as well as here, have to choose which child's going to eat today. I think it breaks God's heart when we take funds from the military uh, and then we use them uh, to put up a wall knowing that what we've done is illegal uh, and it defies Congress's power to control the purse strings. I think God, it breaks God's heart when he sees how his children are divided over ideology over differences, and just because we have differences doesn't mean that either of us deficient, doesn't mean that either of us are wrong, but it doesn't mean that either of us are right. There are some things about which we're right, there are some things about which we're wrong, and we need to take the time to do some critical thinking Instead of aligning ourselves with a particular party, I appreciate it. I don't quote him very often what Jesse Jackson said. He says that we ought to act like some of our other brothers and sisters. They don't have abiding enemies. They don't have abiding allies. They just have abiding interests. And we need to make sure that we align ourselves with people who will protect and promote our interests, but do so not at the expense of other people. It breaks God's heart when he sees churches that build monuments to the egos of pastors, but do nothing in the larger community. And for millennials, generation X, Y, and Z, all they know is simply all they care about. They, wanna, they want not so much to know whether or not what we say is true. They want to know whether or not we care. What difference does our faith make? And if our faith doesn't make any difference in the real world, they just say, no way, Jose, you can keep that. If we want to woo them, we got to demonstrate that we are, we are aligned with him who went about doing good. We got to show that we're connected to the one who offers an invitation to transformation, not just to individuals. But if you look at John 11, it was to the whole community that Lazarus is a part of. They all got involved in the work of transformation and there will be no transformation until the community comes together. That's why Jesus, who could have moved the stone himself, asked the community to do it. Because when the community comes together, the community discovers uh, that it can do more together that it can do a part. There are some things that God will not do till we come together. God saw uh, and God repented. And then finally it said, God spoke. What God verbalizes is what crystallized in the mind of God. That God reached the point where God undoubtedly declared, and I imagine that uh, there comes a point after we have thumbed our nose at his grace and turned our nose, turned our back on his mercy. There comes a point where God has a cutoff switch. I do not know where it is. I do not know where the line is, but there comes a point when God says, I will not be mocked. There comes a point where God says, vengeance is mine. There comes a point where God draws a proverbial line in the sand and God says, it's time now for the wicked to cease from troubling. It's time for the weary to be at rest. It's time for that which is wrong to be made right. We will go no further. It's time. Check this out. God says, in effect, it's time for a new beginning. It's time for a fresh start. And I don't know about you, but I need a fresh start. Not since the first day I met Jesus, but I needed a first start and I continue to need one every day. Is there anybody here who understands that just because you used to sin, it doesn't mean that you're still not sinning. There are sins of omission and sins of commission. And even when we don't think we're sinning against God, we got to remember that when we sin against God, sin against 
other people. Uh, we're simultaneously sinning against God. Uh, looks into John. He says, how can you uh, say that you love God uh, and you hate the brother or sister uh, that you do see? Uh, think about it. How many people do we walk past? Uh, how many people do we just say talk to the hand? Uh, how many people do we dress down? Uh, not to their face, but behind their back. How many people do we stab in the back? Uh, how many people do we do we talk down uh, and not build up? Uh, is there anybody here who could confess uh, that we are at a point where God needs to reboot the country, that God needs to reboot your family, that God needs to reboot the church. And I don't mean just the black church. I mean, wherever churches are found, because we're no longer driven by the love of Christ. We're no longer driven by a sense of purpose that seeks to, tra to represent Christ in the larger world so that when people look at us and they look at Jesus, they have a difficult time detecting the difference between us and Jesus. Come here. God speaks. And I thought about it and I said to myself, uh, God could have just waved his hand. So why does God speak? And then I discovered that if you go back to Genesis 1, you discover, you, you learn that God is the, spoke, uh, the first spoken word poet. No. God uh, said, exercised the, the divine prerogative and said, let there be. And the text says, and it was, and not only was it, it says, and it was good. And it was morning uh, and evening on the first day. It was morning and evening on the second day until he got down to the sixth day. And he said, not only is it good, but it's very good. Uh, yeah, God speaks. And when God speaks, things happen. When we speak, things happen inside of people. Either we build them up or we tear them down. Either we encourage them or discourage them. Either we put them down or we lift them up. The power of the tongue. Do not forget it. I have to repent because of things I say. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes intentionally, but when I reflect on it, I say that was not your best self. Sometimes in a flash of anger, I don't care. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. The Lord's still working on me with that turn the other cheek thing. My thing is, if I don't bother you, you don't bother me. All right? And if you corner me and you think you're going to punk me, Ain't nothing but air and opportunity. And I believe in the ministry of laying on our hands. I'll kick your butt and pray about it later on. Because sometimes people don't take you seriously until you know how to speak their language. You know, Jesus didn't speak classical Greek he spoke koine it's the natural language of the people and sometimes you got to speak the language of the streets with people who don't know nothing but street <laughs> let, let me see if I can help you here uh, I, I have now a uh, I, I have a uh, countryman a countryman a mini countryman I love that thing it is, uh, it runs on gas, gets excellent miles, but it also is electric. And I get great mileage. And I'm re I am reducing the carbon footprint by driving a car uh, that is ecologically sound, that's economical, but also pragmatic value. In New York City, parking is hard to find. So when I had uh, my big car, uh, my SUV, I couldn't find parking. But now I can find parking any and everywhere. And what I've discovered is, after I read the manual, you'll see where I'm going in a second, uh, I discovered that when I put my phone in the car and I give a command, my car is now sunk with my voice. So what I say to my car, my car does automatically. Uh, see, you can say something to my car and my car will ignore you. Uh, that's because you ain't the owner. But if it is the case uh, that I get in the car and I I speak to the car, uh, the car activates uh, and it starts moving. Uh, is there anybody here who understands uh, that your boss may say something to you? Uh, your sister or brother may say something to you, but help me Holy Ghost. When God speaks, 
We may try to ignore him, uh, but we just can't help it. Uh, he is the love of our soul. Uh, when God speaks, uh, he opens doors that no man can close uh, and closes doors that no man can open. Uh, when God speaks, uh, he reshapes us. Uh, he remakes us uh, so that we're better, brighter, wiser than we were before. Well, I'll leave you with this. What I appreciate is that finally God sees his safeguard. Where, where is his safeguard? The text says that uh, God saw evil everywhere and then God spoke. But verse 8 said, but whenever you see that incredible uh, conjunction, you need to know that something's about to happen. Uh, but uh, sets up a contrast between what's said before and what's about to come after. He says, but God remembered Noah. God had built in a safeguard and decided that when things got bad, what he would do uh, is that he would give himself a visible, uh, vocal uh, reminder uh, that he has promised to, to give a mulligan uh, to people uh, who, who confess their sins. Uh, somebody said, if we confess our sins, uh, he's faithful and just uh, and he will forgive. Uh, when we go before God uh, and we do so with humility uh, and honesty, uh, then God can work with us and then God can work on us and sometimes we don't like when God starts working in people's lives Jonah went down to Nineveh didn't want to go turned his back on Nineveh because he knew what the Assyrians had done to the Jews but I come back here to tell you that God caused the wind to come and they had to throw him overboard and then a fish swallowed him uh, and the text says he was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights sometimes uh, God just has to make you steal uh, sometimes God pushes the pause button uh, sometimes God says uh, be still uh, and know that I am God uh, and I will be exalted uh, but I don't know how you feel about it uh, God had a fail safe uh, but his fail safe failed uh, the text says he chose Noah, but Noah got drunk on the eve of reconstruction. He chose Noah, but Noah cursed out Ham. And notice this, he cursed out Ham, but he called the name Cana. You'll get that when you get home. He was trying to curse out Ham, but the writer said that it wasn't Ham that got cursed out. It was Cana. You'll get that when you get home. And I've just come back here to tell you, uh, I appreciate uh, the fact that he took Noah. Uh, is there anybody here uh, who recognizes uh, that after Noah, uh, he had Abraham, uh, Abraham, uh, the friend of God, uh, Abraham, uh, the righteous one, uh, but Abraham went to Egypt, uh, pimped out his wife, uh, got gold and silver, uh, so Abraham couldn't be a fail safe. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, uh, but I remember uh, that not only that uh, but I'm told uh, at the Akedo uh, Abraham took his son uh, up to the Mount Moriah uh, and he engaged uh, in threatening behavior uh, he engaged uh, in psychological uh, and almost physical abuse uh, when he was going to offer his son uh, back up to God uh, and so he couldn't uh, be the perfect failsafe uh, David David came uh, and David was called uh, after he sinned with Bathsheba, uh, a man after his own heart. Uh, but David uh, committed too many sins, uh, had a national cover up uh, about a woman. Uh, doesn't that sound strange? Uh, Lee familiar. Uh, and the text says uh, that God held them accountable. Uh, but then David cried out, uh, Created me uh, a clean heart. Uh, and renew within me uh, a right spirit. Uh, cast me away. Uh, from, don't uh, cast me away uh, from your presence. Uh, but bring back the joy uh, of my salvation. Uh, I don't care what you think. Uh, I just came by here to tell you uh, he had fail things that failed. Uh, but I know somebody 
that God had in his back pocket. I know somebody that never fails. I know somebody who came down 40 in two generations. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I know somebody who went down to the revival at the riverside and God turned on the public address system and said this is my beloved son in whom I will please. I know somebody who went about doing good. One day he went on up to Calvary and he had a fail safe. Father if it be possible let this cup pass from me uh, but I came by here to tell you uh, not my will but thine be done I'm so glad he went on up to Calvary uh, and on that blood sloped uh, windswept hill uh, gave his hands to the thorns uh, gave his feet to the spikes uh, gave his brow to the crown of thorns uh, and then he gave up the goats uh, but he had a fail safe uh, it says that it says that Joseph of Amarthea uh, came and claimed his body uh, put him in the grave but God had a fail safe for those who didn't know Jesus uh, the text says uh, on Saturday 1st Peter 3 18 uh, he opened up the trap door of his soul uh, descended down into hell uh, preached the emancipation proclamation uh, to those who were held captive but early early uh, on Easter Sunday morning uh, he shot up out of the grave and he said oh death where is thy sting uh, grave where is thy victory I just came by uh, to tell you uh, my testimony uh, I don't know why Jesus loves me I don't know why he cares I don't know why uh, he sacrificed his son but I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad I wish I had five people who were glad I wish I had three people uh, who look back over their life uh, and when you think about it uh, your soul yes let us praise God yes I am so glad that God sees all and God knows all that God had a fail safe named Jesus amen church amen let us thank God Reverend Anthony Trufant reminding us that God does indeed see us. The doors of the church are open. I wonder if somebody here today, maybe they need a reboot. You tried self-help. You tried your family. You tried your friends. Maybe you even tried drugs. I don't know what you tried. But now you realize it's time to try Jesus. Because Jesus sees you. He knows what you're going through. So I wonder if there's one person here on today who knows that today is the day that God is calling you to take that step to be in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Is there one person? Maybe you have a relationship, but you don't have a church home. You've just been flirting a little bit, going on a few dates. Maybe it's time to make a commitment because we're not called to do this by ourselves. We're called to be in community with each other. I wonder if there is one. I'll do what you say.
on my way in I had to answer nature's call as soon as I got off the plane and I don't mean to be cruel but I do mean to be instructive so I looked for the first restroom I could find and when I went to the men's restroom there was a sign out of order it should have been operational but it was out of order I came with the expectation of being able to use it but it was out of order so then I had to search for another restroom quickly and when I got to that restroom what I discovered was there were people in those stalls and then the one that was not being used was stopped up out of order my sense of urgency made me keep searching until I could find one that worked and the interesting thing about it was I had other people who were waiting on me to make a call back to the East Coast but I couldn't make the call until I could find one that was in order I was holding up other people because I couldn't find one that was in order. I want you to know that New Beginnings is a church. I don't know where you've been before, but that does things decently in order. But, but it's not just a church that is efficient and operates on standards and systems, but it is a church that will meet you exactly where you are, but will never leave you as you are. New Beginnings is a church that takes seriously the ministry of hospitality. They believe in welcoming people. That, that's why the welcome lasts longer here than it does in other places. And, and that's why people don't ask you to come up front and, and make a speech about who you are because they know that you're afraid to do so. You just want to worship in anonymity, but you want somebody to smile at you, to welcome you. That's new beginnings. And then you're in a church that is not only excellent at spiritual transformation, but a church that is excellent at social justice. This church will teach you not only to share the good news with your lips, but with your life. And so I want to invite you today. You'll be out of order if you don't come. Other people are waiting on us. We about to go to brunch. So don't stay there when you know God is speaking to you. Because when you do, you're out of order. Okay, let me use religious language so you get it. You're disobedient. You engage in sinful behavior. If you know the truth, walk in it. And then don't worry about what's going to happen when you come because I want you to know, God's got you. Ain't nothing that's going to happen to you here that God doesn't, won't catch you, won't bring you through. So as the ministry of music comes, I just want you to look at the person next to you and say, he crazy like our pastor. If he's waiting on you, you better come on. Get to stepping. Come on, music ministry. Why don't you come? Now is the time. This is the place. person on your other side and if you just look at them and say he ain't like Reverend Braxton he can't sing he'll stop singing if you come on uh, you know when, when I go to bars I still go the, the, the record says do not be drunk at, drunk on much wine I don't get drunk don't look in my glass I won't look in yours but they have this phrase when they're about to shut down, last call. And so this is the last call. God speaking to you. If you resonated with that word, here's a place where you're not gonna get some jack leg preacher just shouting at you. But you're gonna get a word that speaks to your individual 
and corporate experience, a word that you can take with you out in the world and apply it to your life and you will be appreciably better. I see you coming, my sister. As the music ministry comes back to us, why don't you come? Somebody else is here. You know who you are. 